Well, good evening. I think we're ready to get started with our program for this evening. I'm Dr. Barbara Fink, and I'm the uh, LCM Alliance Director. I think all of you know me. How are things going for the semester? Are you finished? <laughs> Almost finished for some of you. Finished for some of you. That's good. Well, I want to thank the panel members so much for the time and effort they put into uh, being here this evening with us to participate in this uh, panel, which is part of the programming for the Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation, uh, or the LSAMP program. LSAMP is a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation that honors Lewis Stokes, our congressman from Cleveland. And uh, the purpose of the LSAMP program is to increase underrepresented uh, student uh, retention and recruitment and um, ultimately uh, persistence and attainment of degrees in science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM degrees. And our particular alliance is made up of 11 Ohio institutions, and the Ohio State University is the lead institution. So at each institution, some of the programming will include advisement and counseling, uh, bridge programs and early arrival programs, tutoring and supplemental instruction, um, opportunities for faculty, mentored undergraduate research, uh, as well as uh, peer mentoring, uh, workshops such as this, and then the students receive stipends for their participation in uh, LC University. I got my BS and OD degrees from Indiana University. I worked three years at Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, uh, where I helped start a new school of optometry there. And then I came to Ohio State for my master's and PhDs in um, physiological optics. And I've been here at Ohio State since 1984. So why don't we start at the far end? I'll start with Dr. Schiff, since I know him fairly well. <laughs> uh, also at the College of Optometry. And again, a brief introduction of yourself, uh, where you currently work, um, your educational background, and a brief description of your career path. Okay, one minute, right? <laughs> That'll be tough. Hi, uh, right away, I'm Dr. Melvin Schiff. I happen to be the Dean of the College of Optometry here at Ohio State. Uh, I, uh, my degrees are, I received my undergraduate degree of Dr. Optometry from Indiana, Indiana University, uh, a Master's in Public Health from Harvard University, and a DRPH from the University of Minnesota here. <laughs> say it? Easy say it. Uh, my career path has been a little uh, circular. Uh, upon graduation, I joined the Navy uh, as a result of a scholarship and uh, served four years in the Navy and realized that I wasn't sure where I wanted to practice. And so then I went to the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where I joined the faculty there and was an academic administrator, stayed there for some time, uh, and migrated here north to uh, Ohio State in 2004. Retiring in 2014 as some important, and that's why I'm smiling. <laughs> Hello, my name is Carmel Thomas. I am currently a senior engineer with Cummins Engine Business out of Columbus, Ohio, Columbus, Indiana, excuse me. Um, I have a bachelor's in product design engineering from Wayne State University. I'm currently finishing my master's there as well. My career path has been pretty direct. I've been with Cummins for about four years now. I'm working mainly with our little business units, helping them to do installations and installation quality. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Angel Arroyo Rodriguez. I'm currently the environmental planner and sustainability coordinator with the High Environmental Protection Agency in the Division of Materials and Waste Management. My um, undergraduate, uh, completed my undergraduate at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. I did my bachelor's in environmental science and biology. I was one of those that stayed longer, did double major, then came here to the Ohio State University and got my master's in um, molecular cellular and environmental biology. And as part of that, I decided that I had long. My love for science, for biology, also like the social sciences. So I did a double master's and senior regional planning, and I'm currently working on my PhD in senior regional planning. Hello, my name is Jessica Lopez. I'm the director of the 
Thomas. Um, I currently work at Owens Corning, which is a installation company, uh, and I work as an advanced engineer there, basically a learning scientist. <laughs> and I have my bachelor's in chemical engineering from the University of Notre Dame, my PhD also in chemical engineering from the University of Texas in Austin. Um, they are studying their regeneration. In terms of career path, well, I've been in school for a really long time, and I just finished in December. So I have a very short career path, but in terms of uh, internships, I worked at Frito Lay, uh, working with food manufacturing, uh, aircraft engines at GE. Uh, I have done polymer science at a company called Lionel Chemical Company, so in the derivatives of the oil and gas industry. And I did some IT consulting at Deloitte, uh, which is a, one of the big four accounting firms. Um, and then I had an internship in DuPont as well, so we had coatings for paints and polymers. Um, and then I had a full ride in the Caribbean looking at how um, diabetes it affects, or it affects uh, the population um, in the Caribbean. And then now I am actually working a full time job. So, what's uh, going Thank you. My name is Leonard Sparks. I tried to look around to see who I recognize. Some of you may know me as Mr. Kosai. I work at Kosai and I've been there for 33 years. Uh, I probably work with some of your parents uh, if you're from the Columbus area. Uh, I originally am from Oklahoma City and I, had, I got my bachelor's degree at Lane College, which is one of the HBC schools. And of course I came to Ohio State where I received a master's in political science with an emphasis on public policy. When I came out of school, uh, maybe what do you think I am? Uh, the government was being geared down. I couldn't find a job directly related to public policy. I fell back on what I got from my undergraduate degree, my teaching certificate. Found some employment at one of the country's unique science museums, uh, and the rest is history, been there ever since. Uh, I have a rich history of pioneering COSI on wheels, and if you've ever been to COSI, uh, one of my remote famous shows is I taught the original set of rats to play basketball. If you've ever seen a rat basketball show in the coast, I, uh, I, in making the two way to three. Uh, and of course, uh, my career path, I, how do I describe myself? I am a science educator in a glamorous classroom. Uh, if you've ever been to Kosai, you know it's unique and different, uh, but I have the wonderful job of inspiring people uh, to learn more about themselves in the future. So I'm rather unique. I kind of get across all of these. I have to help people understand lenses so that they can better appreciate the eye doctor. Uh, I have to help people understand chemical properties so they can better appreciate uh, things like we created the mummy exhibit and things like that. And so uh, I have a rather diverse background. Uh, it's good to see you. And, uh, I brought toys in case you get bored. I missed the post <laughs> I didn't go there. So there were weird objects on the Never miss a teaching moment. Touch that for me now. Grab it. She brought the force with her today. Man, how do I follow that? Um, my name is Keisha Slaughter, and I am a vice president of strategy and process improvement at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, my background is um, I went to Northwestern University, industrial engineering degree, and then went on to pursue my graduate degree at University of Texas. Um, it's civil engineering with a concentration in transportation. Um, so you ask, geez, how do you get to JP Morgan Chase? It's been a very, very diverse career. I started in logistics, supply chain, um, started my career with UPS, um, I've done consulting, I've worked in various distribution companies, um, I partnered with this great guy here a while ago, several years ago with Ohio Sim. Learning Network, where I was a project manager there, helping science and engineering and STEM programs across Central Ohio, and helping STEM schools develop and STEM education summer programs. So I've had a very diverse, um, diverse career. I just I, I would love enjoying. I, I enjoy learning. So when I get to a point where I'm not learning in a position where I kind of just gets to you know business as usual, then I start looking for something else to challenge me. So I had worked in the banking field. Um, saw an opportunity to do the process improvement, which is what I've done in every career and every industry, and just was excited to see what I can do with that. Okay, we can start in the first row down to the end. Hello, my name is Colleen Brown. 
currently a product engineer for IBM. Um, originally a Brooklyn, New York resident, moved to Lexington, Kentucky, started my career path with IBM in global services, got moved over to quality engineering, and now I'm current role product engineering. I went to Morehouse College, Bachelor of Science with a minor in math and physics, dual degree major, also went to Georgia Tech, have an industrial engineering degree, and a thousand other things that I'm missing right here that I'm not telling you, but you can get it just as, as we go through. Hello, my name is Yvette Kiel Llamas. I'm originally from Madrid, Spain. I had my bachelor's degree in the Polytechnic University of Madrid in uh, naval architecture and marine engineering. And I came to the States to get my master's in the University of Iowa uh, in computational fluid dynamics. And from there, I moved to Central Ohio to work for Rolls-Royce Energy, uh, originally to do compressor design, and stayed with them for seven years. After that, I uh, moved to another company here in Central Ohio that did hydraulic power transmission. They designed um, hydraulic motors big crashers and things like that. So if you ever see a car crasher, they pick on water that moves that, that's what we did. Then I moved to a company that did um, turbochargers for big diesel engine applications for a couple of years, and now I'm back with Walsh Royce Energy as a technical bit support project manager, so. My name is Brian Thomas. I am a graduate of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Uh, industrial technology degree, uh, currently working on finding out where to go for my MBA. Um, at a point in my career where to be a president or uh, director, vice president, you, you need it. So uh, be looking uh, to start 2015 fall. Uh, my career, uh, which I would encourage you to maximize with whatever company you work with, has taken me many places. Uh, I've worked in Memphis, Tennessee, Athens, Georgia, Michigan, Indiana, Alabama, Texas, just left China, just left Paris, France. We'll be back in Paris in two weeks, taking my wife and my mother for Mother's Day. It's, these are the type of things that uh, corporate America and just different companies and universities can provide. I encourage you to take advantage of those things. Uh, make a lot of products. Um, I've made things from superchargers for Corvettes, differentials, directional control valves, I worked in the food industry, making waffles for Kello, and I currently make exhaust systems. So, so just a bit. Hello, my name Good evening, everyone. My name is Russell Mars. I'm originally from Fresno, California. I did my undergrad at University of the Pacific, where I received my Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. I worked for a very, very short time as a national laboratory and then flew off to grad school to my Master's in Chemical Engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, from Georgia Tech, I came here to Columbus to work for Mattel. I'm currently a practicing chemical engineering research scientist and one of the technical leads on a large driving project here. I've only got a lot. It, uh, it's been a very, very interesting ride from undergrad to where I am now. I'm also currently the uh, NASA Black Engineers uh, Global Professionals Chair. Good afternoon, I think, or evening. Uh, my name is Ramona Reyes. Uh, I'm a little bit of an anomaly here. I did get my uh, bachelor's here at Ohio State University. I got it in marketing and transportation logistics. I'm also a proud member of Alpha Salamander fraternity, the Hispanic co fraternity here at Ohio State University. Uh, I have about four jobs. Uh, I'm an associate publisher for Who's Who Latino Columbus. I do drug-free, substance-free workplace training in Spanish for a woman-owned company here in Columbus. I also am the, I sit on the Columbus Board of Education, uh, and I am the first elected Latina to hold that, that uh, post currently. Um, and then the job that pays the bills is I have been working at Nationwide for over 21 years. I'm currently a human resource uh, specialist, meaning I can get most of these people jobs, probably not nationwide. Uh, but uh, I've had 21 years, but I've had nine or 10 different jobs. 
So I've been in public relations, I've been in IT, I've been in HR, I've been in customer service, I've been in investments. I've had to get licenses for each of those, series six licensures, all sorts of uh, certifications and so forth. So as uh, some of our colleagues here stated, uh, take advantage of your uh, opportunities with companies that actually have tuition reimbursement because uh, my next step is getting my master's in education. So. Good evening. Um, uh, sorry, I can't wait, I'm a sergeant with the Columbus Police Department. I fly the helicopters that go over there, uh, the football game on, and see the score. Um, <laughs> Thank God they, they put that big screen down and we could actually see the game. Um, my career started in aviation high school. I went to uh, aviation high school back in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, shortly after I graduated, actually two days, I joined the military as a helicopter mechanic and then got the opportunity to go to the military flight school. And I retired from the military as a maintenance touch pilot flying uh, Blackhawks and Hueys and Cobras. Um, uh, I'm a 20-year veteran of the police department, and I am, for the FAA, a designated examiner. I license the uh, new students that are getting their license to become airplane pilots and helicopter pilots. So I use my aviation every day and it's a pretty long career. And my next step is uh, looking for my doctorate with uh, Embry-Riddle University, which is uh, an aviation doctor. Thank you for those introductions. I have a second question that I would like all of you to answer in turn. Um, that question is, what challenges associated with being a person of color have you experienced in your career paths? And if you're a woman, what challenges have you experienced as a woman of color? So, Dr. Shipp, do you want to start again, or should we let someone else have that pleasure? <laughs> so I've probably had more experiences, so it may take longer. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I think all of us, all of us here uh, understand the meaning of that question. Um, and I think all of us understand that each of us have had our experiences uh, with the burden, I should say, in this country and society of being a person of color or being a female, uh, or the combination of being a female a person of color is even more severe, sure. Um, the challenges that I faced, uh, because I, when I was at your point, uh, your age, that was a little while ago. And this country was undergoing major changes. And at that time, even now, um, the expectation was that if you want to be successful, you had to run faster to hire, excel, and aggregate and others to have the same opportunities. Well, I did that. And I'm sure the other panelists here uh, had the same experience. And uh, quite frankly, although at the time it was a bit resentful, uh, at this point in my life when I look back, I'm kind of glad because it allowed me to really excel, uh, to force myself to go the extra mile to really determine what I could do. And as I look back, I've done far more than I ever could have imagined in terms of my career, personal development, etc. So although at the time, like I said, it was uh, not a pleasant experience, but uh, I turned it around and made something possible. Um, I would have to say that for me, the challenge that I've seen um, really originated when I, when I was entering um, in Ohio um, was a cultural type of challenge. I felt that there was a learning curve for me to try to understand persons of different uh, backgrounds and for them to understand myself and to all, for all of us to speak the same cultural language as for the company. Each company has a different vibe or a different way that they do business. And I think going in and learning, okay, this is how this company operates. When they're saying these words, this is what they mean. Um, and I think the thing that helped me was not being afraid to say, I don't know what you're talking about, or can, can you explain that in a different way for me? So if you say that you need to do this faster, what is faster you do? To me, that means you need this probably in an hour. Let me know it's different. So it was almost like a cultural translation of, just the normal everyday things that the company knew that I may not have known would be outside of me. Um, for me, in terms of 
the culture shock that I had was when I moved. I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I went to college there. I knew English. How to how to read and writing English really well because most of our texts were in English. But I really didn't speak the language. Once when I came to Ohio State, uh, the graduate program, they took this English as a second language exam. Of course, I got a ninety something percent down. They sent me as a kid. And I completely panicked because I I just couldn't speak the language. So the first two months of me as a TA, I have to practice everything, every now, how I was going to say it. I have to write everything. And luckily, the students, most of the students were pretty cooperative and just became kind of a nice exchange. Certainly, a couple of students sometimes get a little fresh and have to handle them. You know? But um, it really wasn't. A big deal. Then I spent here in the other school for a long time. I know it's in such a diverse place that me having an accent, me being from different places, really wasn't an issue. Once I went to work at Ohio APA, that's when actually I first I met for the first time people that had grown and the older Nigerian colonies. And the way that they saw the city, the way that they saw the environment was very different. Than what I saw. And right now, I'm the Habib probably two Puerto Ricans and Malayans, and it's 1,200 people. So it's a little different. And then, on top of that, I'm probably the biggest Puerto Rican there is. So, one of the north things that people say when I say I'm from Puerto Rico, I said, Well, you're not Puerto Rican. I said, So, what is Puerto Rican supposed to do for <laughs> So people, you know, sometimes people, you got me they don't say anything until they hear me asking them, you know, they're like, where's this guy from? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, actually, most of the time, I cannot say that I ever had a bad experience because of that. That's actually like an iceberg. And even when I go, I travel all throughout Ohio for my work and go to um, small towns, and some people, you know, they generally ask I never heard you ask me for where you are talking. So I never really had a, I would say, it's your voice if you actually write a speaker. Maybe twice as other people kind of began to look different, but I cannot say that I have a nice experience. I think it's all time to take it, it's all time to handle it. And for me, it's actually being a little different than everyone else has been asking.
probably older than most of you think. Originally from Oklahoma. And Oklahoma City had a turbulent time during the 80s in school integration. Uh, there are ugly things. Uh, there are times when uh, there was an incident where people actually opened fire on a school bus. Uh, kids getting off a bus. Getting off. So uh, I have lived through that experience. I was active in my youth with the NAACP. And if I bring it home, I pioneered Cosine on Beers, uh, which is a traveling sign show. Big business now, 14 people in a fleet of trucks, travel Ohio and three surrounding states. How do I say this to you? People used to think I was the movie man. They would look around me, expecting someone else to follow. But I would set up the show, do the show, perform the show, take the show down, and uh, I did not let it get in my way. Uh, uh, how do I take it? It was probably not an easy thing to do, but uh, I was committed somehow. Uh, here is what it is, the legacy. Because I went through it, like some of your parents and grandparents, uh, the effort to stand tall and to be the best you could be, and that is what it's all about. And I say I applaud you because you're <coughs> sitting in the room. Many of you probably know that we weren't always able sit next to each other, all right? And so some of us have looked at personally, believe it or not, I'm old enough and I don't believe that, but I have, uh, when people expected me to go somewhere else uh, when I walked in the room. But uh, that's what it was like for me. But it took willpower, uh, and it took me, uh, people stepping out in those early years so that we could stand on their shoulders. So uh, that's what it was like come through it all. But the point is, you all are, I would like to say, the remnants of the legacy. And what's the testament now? There are still some challenges out there. And the fact that you're standing arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, means that some of you are choosing to do something about it. So I faced some challenges uh, coming up in my career. Um, on a basic level, I think the best thing to do is just to be assertive. Um, I pride myself on being able to talk to pretty much anybody anywhere from Brooklyn 
went to school in Atlanta, so it had a diverse array of people around me all the time. Um, it's always good to have knowledge of the background or interest in people you're going to be in struggles with, your employers. That's usually the best way to get your foot in the door. But if you're assertive and show them how serious you are, then one of my things is to always think of the question my boss hasn't asked yet. So frequently I'll come in with um, suggestions for certain things that maybe haven't been thought about, um, along with you know being able to reach people in positions that may be way higher than me or way lower than me. That was probably one of my uh, key tactics before I got to RTP and IBM. Um, I spoke to the vice president the same way I spoke to the janitor that I saw every day. So a lot of things came my way because they knew I could get it done just because they knew I had no problem talking to anyone. And they also knew that I, I treated everybody the same for the most part. But um, on a basic level, like I said, just be assertive. Let everyone know how serious you are when you approach something. And I would say don't take no for an answer. Don't be a, uh, I don't want to use a bad word here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Just let someone know how serious you are. Um, I was an adjunct professor at a community college in New York um, while I was working in New York for IBM as well. And I got a teacher to get a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of people here do. Um, a lot of accolades that we get, a lot of pedestals that people put you on. But as long as you do what you love, as long as you take everything that you do serious. Um, you, know, you don't really have to notice it yourself, but they will notice it for you. So again, just be serious in what you're doing, be assertive in everything that you do, and there'll be challenges, but for the most part, you'll be able to make it through. Hi. Well, one of the, my biggest challenges, I guess, is when you move from a different country and you have to get used to people sometimes not understanding you or thinking that your accent is too thick and all the cultural differences that, that come through. And that's at the beginning, it's a little bit of a challenge, then it helps you uh, because you never take anything for granted or you never assume that anybody's gonna give you anything or any type of response. Like when you are used to see always people similar to you or the same type, you are always looking at them with an assumption that what's the answer they are gonna give you when you put something in front of them. So that, is something that you have to get rid of pretty quickly because the world is pretty transnational right now and you are going to work with people from every place in the world and the way that you think that somebody's going to answer you is never the way that they are going to do it because they come from a completely different background and it's very difficult sometimes when you are involved in a very deep, in a in a big place where everybody is just like you to accept that the answer that the other person is giving you is just as valid as the one that the group, the majority of the group is giving you. So if you are a minority, you have to get used to the fact that they always don't question you because you are coming from a completely different point of view. Also, for, as a woman, you always have the challenge of having to project a very serious fascia, so you have to be very careful with how you talk, how you dress, and how you conduct yourself, otherwise they will write you off so fast that you don't even know <laughs> what happened. So it is very important that all you ladies be very mindful when you go to interviews and when you go to work on how you always present yourself very assertively. Because at least I have always worked in an industry where I'm the only woman in the room all the time, and they have this tendency to just treat you like you are the little girl in the room. You didn't go for school or things like that. So you have to pass through that and project yourself very assertively to make them know that you are here for the same reasons and you are a very serious person. So that's an extra challenge for the women that I think the, the guys have sometimes that you are just have to get over it very quickly because it's gonna happen to you a lot, especially at the beginning when you guys just leave the school and you look very young. And everybody thinks like you're the secretary or you know you're there to take notes or they sing for coffee and you're just Ooh, what happened here? But sometimes you also will go to customers that they have a, they come from a culture where women don't have positions of power, so it's an extra added layer 
where they don't want to talk to you, even though you are the person in charge. So you're going to have to learn to deal with that and don't let it face you, because at the end of the day, you're in charge. That's the only thing that matters. I'll uh, start with the, the challenge just in my career. Um, last eight years, I've lived in seven cities, six states, and eight job titles. Um, it's, I'm giving you those figures because it's fear. Uh, the greatest challenge is the fact that I've started over uh, that many times, and you have to basically re hit the restart button over and over and continue to uh, prove yourself, even though you're getting promoted. Uh, the higher you go within a company, uh, it's hard. Uh, the higher chance, the greater chance you have of losing your job is when you actually get promoted. Uh, the more pressure, the more responsibility. Uh, as a person of color inside of, of corporate America, I think the hardest thing to do is actually to not allow the frustration to show. Uh, you have to learn how to vent um, outside of the work workplace or have someone inside the workplace that you can talk to if, if needed. But if there's any, any problems you run into with being a person of color or any concerns you have, you're gonna have to find that place of uh, refuge uh, because it's not acceptable behavior. You don't, like I said earlier, someone may think you're emotional uh, and can't be trusted or things like that. So as a person of color, that is extremely um, concerning when you try to hold it in. So you have to find a place uh, to vent. Um, I, from the woman's standpoint, I want to speak just on the woman's standpoint real briefly. Uh, as a person who has women who, who work for him and have worked uh, with women, uh, one of the things I see is the greatest challenge for women. One is the attire that women wear, making sure that you're presentable and professional. But the biggest is when I look at a person in college when I work in a recruiting office, the first thing that a lot of recruiters do is look at a young man's potential. They don't look at the young woman and say, that can be our vice president. A lot of recruiters naturally look at a man and say, he can be a future leader. So when you're young at this point in your career, that first presentation you give to one of the companies that recruits you, show them the leadership inside of you. And that starts with how you talk, how you walk, your behavior, your handshake. But let them see that you can be something because that's what companies invest in. They're paying you money because they want you to be something greater later in life. So as a woman, it's that first interaction that you have that can really uh, gain a mentor and someone to support you. Challenges. One of the first things that comes to mind is from, really from grade school, we've always hated the middle person. And you know, as far as I can remember back, I remember back in sixth grade, there was my sixth grade teacher told my parents, no, essentially you can't go to the math science now, so you, you have your grades, but you, you're not going to survive in that period. The teacher told me, you would do an hour to find um, Those examples of almost nonsense reasons why I didn't succeed kept repeating themselves throughout my academics and have continued uh, into my professional career. People, from a professional standpoint, uh, countermanding decisions or second, second guessing um, my direction. They're, they're not necessarily being a good reason. That's something uh, that you, you're always, you can never ever always put your finger on it from a person of color standpoint, but you always suspect that there's a, there's a, there's a cultural issue there at minimum, and that's always a challenge to um, Another aspect is you may be the first, or you may be virtually the first. And one thing I'm always fond of saying is we're still in the time of first. There are people who are still the first one to go to college, nonetheless get a, a STEM degree. Uh, first, I mean, a politician in a particular area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you come into the workplace, and though you may be by far not the first minority in the department, uh, there may be 20 engineers, and at that time, you are the only one. And so it's like you are virtually the first. And in that sense, you are always breaking, you are breaking the ground, and that can be very
very, very uh, challenging. Uh, one of the things that, that comes off this line is as you amass all of these experiences, uh, some of these can, can be very heavy, uh, can be very negative as you go through them and survive and move on and continue to excel. Um, but those collective experiences build your character. It's important to understand how those experiences build your character. So one of my recommendations is really take time to understand yourself because you will carry those things through with you. It might be something that as I mentioned makes you resentful, might make you overly cautious, might make you defensive. And you need to understand how those things have shaped you and if nothing else turn them into a positive. To do that, you need to be very, very deliberate at times. Very deliberate. Uh, success is, is, is a deliberate, deliberate effort. And so again, I think I just urge you, you know, as has been said, seek out mentors, seek out sponsors. But a lot of times the resources will not be given to you outright. And the resources you need may not be obvious. So you're not really ask questions to protect the training you need, to make sure you get the soft skills that you need. I was angry. So I'll just say it out here. I was angry. I was angry when I was in second grade. They told me I couldn't speak Spanish. And I was in South Texas where there was 75% of people that just looked just like me. And I'm like, what, are you kidding me? Everyone's talking Spanish in the playground. Even our teachers speak to us in Spanish. How am I supposed to talk to my grandmother if you're telling me I'm not supposed to be speaking Spanish? Uh, obviously, that all didn't carry out very, very long. I eventually, uh, we, not me, but eventually we learned that uh, that was not something that we were going to follow. But I was very angry. I was very angry when I got to high school. And they told me, because I'm a child of a migrant family that uh, travels from Texas to Ohio, to Indiana, to Utah, to, to uh, other places and uh, picks fruit and vegetables for a living, that there's no way I could possibly be in honors classes because there's no way with my interrupted uh, uh, schooling that I could actually do uh, what everybody else did and actually keep up. And I said, well, why don't you let me decide that? And uh, they started me at the bottom. And I said, that's okay. When I, write, when I finish, I'm gonna be in those honors classes. I'm gonna be taking those IPs. He's like, oh, really? Ha, 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 how are you gonna get to college? Don't worry about it, I'll, I'll figure that out. That's hard work. And eventually, I was fortunate enough that professors here at Ohio State created the Campbell Soup Migrant Scholarship Program. And they were out looking in South Texas and found this little Latina, kind of spicy, did band, dead track. And they said, we want you. We want you to come to Ohio State, which took several visits. Because those of you who come from very overprotective dads, try to convince your father that their little daughter's gonna go 5,000 miles north with nobody to watch over them. And I had six brothers, so I had a lot of security. But fortunate enough to, go, to keep on going. I was very angry when I worked with the Department of Highway Safety, i.e. Highway Patrol. And they're like, ooh, it'd be nice to have a girl patrolman. But you can have to start here. But I have a college degree, but you have to start here. But I know that guy started with some stripes on his shirt. Nope, not wearing monkey suit, not gonna do it, sorry, no, no offense. I was very angry. Then, I was very angry as I decided that I wanted to be in IT and someone said, there's no way because you don't have an IT background. Really? Well, I don't have a job, I need a job. I just got a 60 day notice. I can't work, I need a job. Thankfully, somebody said, I'll teach you. All right, I'll learn. Did that for three years. Then they said, hey, there's a public relations job open. Wonderful, I'll take it. Well, you need to interview, okay? You have a uh, public relations background? No, but I'll learn. <laughs> sure enough, went up there. Then guess what? You don't see the beautiful person now, back then. I had long curly hair, had curly, long, didn't look like anybody, was the only Latina on a public relations floor where everybody dressed a certain way, looked a certain way, and everyone told me, oh, Okay, I, I, I interviewed with Univision, I interviewed with Telemundo. I was the face of my organization, but then my supervisor called me in and says, you don't look the part, you don't dress right, there's something wrong. I said, wow, really? Pulled out a picture, just happened to have a picture here. Tell me how I'm not dressing. I think someone said earlier, make sure you get clarity. Find out what it is that you're not doing. Find out what they want. I said, tell me what you need me to look 
look like? Tell me what you need me to be in order to, well, what, is, what is interrupting, what's keeping you from uh, telling or, or giving me that high performance? I don't know. Okay. Went, went to my uh, mentor, distraught, angry too. Said, I don't understand. I don't, under I don't understand where this came from. I don't, I, I don't get it. And this is what the advice said in this for women, Latinos, anybody. They said, pull up. I had at that time all the Latina style magazines, the Hispanic business magazines. Was, Go in there, pull, pull the pages and look at all the women. Look at all of them and then come back and tell me what you see. Well, actually, he said, look at all the women, then close the book, and then go around your floor and look at all the women on your floor. I said, all right, I can do that. Went out there, looked at the paper. Um, black Latinas, white Latinas, brown Latinas, Asian Latinas, short hair, black hair, red hair, orange hair, uh, long hair, curly hair, straight hair. I'm like, okay, and I closed the page. Then I walked on my floor. Short, blonde. Short, blonde. Short, brunette. Short, brown. Short, 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 short. And I, I'm like, wow. Then I went back to my mentor and he said, what'd you see? And he told me what I saw. And he goes, and how are you different? I'm very different. He goes, does that prevent you from doing your job? I said, no. He goes, so, who, so whose problem is it? Is it your problem or your boss's problem? I said, I think it's my boss's problem. And I continued, continued to show up to show up and use, and a lot of people say don't use your emotion. I, I wasn't angry, I wasn't stopping my feet, I wasn't saying you're wrong, but what I was doing, I was showing up and I was making sure that my work, my, there was nothing that they were gonna say about my work. One of the sayings that uh, I've, I've been raised with is work, you do your job so well that even when you're not there, they know who did it. So I, but that also reminded me, you have to also be humble, right? I have to walk around with a big head and say I'm the first Latina, I'm this, I'm that. I've survived four uh, 60 day notices at Nationwide. I've been trying to get with me, all that. But you gotta be humble, you gotta show up to work, and you gotta make sure that uh, you are aggressive and, and let people know that you have the skills to do your job. I gotta renegotiate my bodyguard. Um, contract with Ramona. <laughs> Me and Ramona have been friends for a long time. And uh, the challenges that I've seen usually is someone else is telling me, you know, they, they just treated you wrong or something like that. I've tried not to let things get, uh, get me bogged down. Um, my mom came from Puerto Rico when she was 21 years old, did not know any English, she did not graduate from high school. When she got to um, Cleveland, she went back to school and was able to retire as a um, Cleveland teacher uh, from the Cleveland Board of Education here. She taught English as a second language. So I saw that as she didn't see any challenges. She saw all the opportunities. I have two daughters that graduated from college. One's in Chicago right now getting a master's in architecture. It's a, um, a field that very few women are in, let alone Latino women. And she's doing that in, because she can do it, and we have the opportunities to do it here. Everything that I've been able to do um, is because I thought I could do it. I didn't think that I should be stopped because I'm a Latino. Um, if you look at everybody's history and resume here, the one times that I felt is, you know, I take my resume, I've done all this stuff, and maybe it fills out this whole table, and then someone says, yeah, but the other guy is male white, so we should give him the job. Well, if you let that bother you, you'll never get anything. So I've never let somebody thinking that another person is better because of this, the color of the skin. I can fly helicopters, I can fly airplanes. Um, next week I'm gonna go fly a jet, which is, for me, is pretty cool. Um, and, and these opportunities come because I'm capable of doing it. And people see me do my work before, and they come back and give me more opportunities. So none of you guys should be able to, you know, because the way, the way you look should stop you. It should be even, yeah, by the way, you know, I'm good at what I, I do. And by the way, I'm Hispanic or I'm a male black or I'm female. You're, that brings, brings um, success to you. 
Um, they shouldn't stop you. They shouldn't bog you down. They should just enhance you. Thank you. Thank you for your candor and for your insights. I have a whole long list of questions I could ask all of you, but I'm only going to ask one more, and then I'm going to open it up for the students to ask questions. So start thinking about what you want to ask and, and who you want to ask. Um, my final question for you, uh, for now at least, is how did you become interested in your field, and um, what is the most rewarding aspect of your field? <laughs> um, I think my my initial uh, exposure to optometry was at Ashra in middle school. First day class, and so the teacher asked us to uh, you know, come, come into the room and take a seat. But rather than allowing us to pick the seat we wanted, she had us sit according to her chart, and so she'd be able to identify us in her names very quickly. But this what happens, and I ended up being the next to the last to my row, which is fine until she started writing the board. And then uh, I turned to my neighbor and I said, "How does she expect us to read that?" And my neighbor said, I can read that. And I thought, like, yeah, right. <laughs> I turned to the person on the other side and said, can you read that? And he said, yeah. And I thought, they're pulling my legs. So I thought, there's a guy behind me who looks pretty serious when I ask him. <laughs> and I did. And he said, yes. So then I realized I had a problem. And that first day of class was pretty tough. But I went home and told my mother this story. Her initial response was, oh, you just want glasses. I said, no, Mom, that's really what happened. And she thought about it for a moment, and she broke out of tears. And I thought, wow, I just couldn't see the board, that's all. <laughs> but she was thinking, as, as all of our mothers do, how, how have I failed my child by not providing him with the appropriate tools to be successful in school? It didn't take long before I had my first night and I got glasses and realized what I'd been missing. But it wasn't just seeing the board, because uh, it impacted my life in other ways, too. Uh, when I would play, um, like uh, pick up baseball, uh, baseball games, I was always the next to the last, the last person being chosen to play. And I typically, was, they assigned me right field, because uh, I was the guy who couldn't see the ball, or didn't catch the ball well, or didn't hit the ball. Well, once I got my glasses, everything changed. I played second, shortstop, and I've had even third or fourth. So it changed me in a, in, a, in a way, a very dramatic way, and I realized that this person who did the science exam on me and determined my problem in very short order, and you know, those of you who are sitting in their own classes, I know exactly what I mean. Um, I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that and making a difference in people's lives in a very positive way. So that's kind of where it all started, and um, I have a very strong appreciation for math, trigonometry, calculus, physics, and so uh, again, the STEM disciplines, and realize how significantly each one of those uh, particular interests are part of the foundation of optometry. And so there was a natural match, and so that uh, is kind of a short way of saying that's how I got where it was. But yeah, the other part of this, and it's the underlying part, is that I, I like helping people. And so that allowed me to put all those uh, preferences together in one place. And so uh, that's how I became a founders. Um, I'll just start by saying uh, my most rewarding of what I, uh, what I do today. Um, and that is, I really enjoy interacting with local demographics, working with people across the world, and helping them to uh, become one with my vision, my company. Uh, just execute the mission. And um, this ties into being a first generation American. And my dad being a mechanic, always being able to work with my hands and see him working with his hands. Uh, I started out, I originally wanted to be an architect. So I did a lot of tinkering, um, building houses. And then one day I got tired of just building houses. I wanted to build robots and I wanted to build machines. And I came up with just different ideas of things I wanted to do. Um, by the time I got to high school, I had programs such as LSM, the kind of uh, program that this had that really helped me to fine tune what I wanted to do. 
I found that I like to see my creations come from idea all the way to seeing them being produced and out in the field. Um, so that's how I got into engineering and uh, what I do today. Um, well, for me, my interests had always been evolving and I trying to figure out what I want to do. Um, but I always kind of know that uh, science is what kind of what I what I like, what I migrate to. And even thinking back to the plan, it was like kind of traveling. We were we were going to play. I have to organize how everything was going to go, where everyone was going to play. We were playing. We have a whole backyard set up as a city when we know we're going to play. And I always liked science. And I actually went to college thinking that I was going to be in pre-med. And that's how I started. And until I realized that we have to cut up in people and that <laughs> wasn't going to fight with me. So, and I actually even applied for pharmacy school. And I almost made it. Luckily, I was just the, sick, the first alternate. And that day, I just went and said I was going to go to environmental science. Because it's more, um, it's more broad, it's more interdisciplinary. I could do science, but I could do something that affects more the world. And I was always, always the kind of person, whenever I went out with my friends, I want to cook the computer, cook the recyclables, clean it up around. So that allowed me to do that. Then as I was doing that, I also discovered that I like science and research, and that's why I do doing biology also, and doing a lot of ecological research. Came to Ohio State and as I'm doing biology, that didn't completely fulfill. I wanted more of the interaction. I didn't like being in the lab, but I'm just killing people all day. I wanted, I like science, but I like helping the applied. And that's how I started developing. And actually, my field is kind of different. When I came to the planning program, there was no one that had a biology background. And people asked me, what, what are you doing here? Everyone comes here from geography or culture. Sciences. And I thought, well, they're environmental planners, they need to know about environment. No, so I don't think this is such a great idea. here. Um, and over the years, I came to Ohio, to Ohio I wanted to be an environmental planner in some ways, but actually what got me hired was on my technical background in biology. And that's how I started. I started doing the, the um, getting involved in folks. That's what I wanted. My job wasn't really planning. But I made it a planning job. And eventually that's how I had all that they gave me a lot of opportunities. Um, so um, as part of planning for the IEPA, things that I have done, um, you know the city of Columbus now has um, the curbside collection for the blue cards, you guys have seen them. I know you have seen them in Columbus. We didn't used to have that, and I helped with part of the team to develop all the the service that we've gone to the cities and trying to figure out what were what people wanted, the frequency, plan of the logistics of how the uh, recycling program was going to work. And that to me that was very fulfilling. Also we had the you know, uh, the stadium, you guys know that we had the zero way stadium and we had a new stadium. It took many years to work with the university, but actually I was involved in that Part in helping them figure out well, who can service, where you can take your compostable, where you can buy some of the materials, what you need to eliminate. So involved in all these kind of behind the scenes things that to me are very rewarding, the kind of things that I enjoy. Basically helping other people to see that doing their job is what is more important to me. And sometimes I completely forget all the things that I have done to college. Oh, I have a little bit of input of these. Also, as part of something else, uh, just follow what you like. Any job is what you make it. From any job, you can learn. When I graduated from Ohio State with the master's, you know what my first job was? Working at Coles, in the child's department, holding clothes. I did that for four months. Actually, that helped me get my job, because my job has a lot of interaction with the public. That helped me demonstrate to them that I have experience working with the public. So even that job that seen it's a different person from what I do now was really very learning uh, experience for me that I could leverage from my other job.
Well, also like Carmela, you have the support situation here. And um, so I come from a Caribbean family, and uh, I don't know how many of you are all of Caribbean, but if you go to college, there are only really three options to study. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a big manager, and engineer kind of falls along in there somewhere. Uh, so science and science-ish type things, that was pretty much the only option. Uh, so my dad is a petroleum engineer, and so uh, he said, you should be a chemical engineer because chemical engineering is more broad than petroleum. So I said, okay, that sounds too shabby. But I also like to argue, so I was like, I want to be a lawyer, so I'll be like a chemical engineering lawyer. So I carried a briefcase, this one's in my backpack and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> And then I saw those commercials, you know, like in the middle of the day, they're like, I can get you $100,000 for your car accident and all that stuff. I was like, I don't want to be on commercials in the middle of the day. I have to, all my children, like, no, no, this, this cannot be my life. Okay, so, get your chemical engineer, right? And uh, they said the chemical kidney was the most difficult major you could have. And I was like, well, I'll start with this one, this one, and I'll just fall into one of the normal majors. And, uh, well, I graduated, so uh, I just went from the chemical uh, but seriously, I really enjoy the applied nature of science, which I think is um, I don't know, really wanted to allude to. Um, so for me, it doesn't really matter what that application is. Um, so it could be a product. And so a lot of us are in industry, and so industries are there to make money, and so they have products. Uh, or it could be more on the policy side, so really influencing how governments um, interface with each other and with their respective societies. So for me, it doesn't really matter what that Final thing is, is though, as long as it is really translating the idea, um, the process, solving that problem, and really bringing that to fruition. So for me, that is the, the most fulfilling aspect of it, and not being on a time to be. <laughs> hmm, all right. Uh, what inspired me, and what is most rewarding? Well, I have to tell the first story. Uh, my friend, the eye doctor down there, I got all the way to high school before I figured out that I couldn't see. I didn't get my glasses until my junior year of high school. And then, the little world, I'm hyped to sight. Boy, like, who are you? <laughs> so that was an interesting story. Uh, well, here it is. What inspired me? Uh, and this is maybe something that inspired me. I, someone believed in me. In middle school, a uh, wonderful teacher, uh, just happened to be, I thought later, uh, she was attracted to but. Uh, she, was, she was my French teacher, and uh, I can share that now with my adults, it's probably inappropriate back then. Uh, but one day she kept me out of school, and she sat me down, and she spoke to me very sternly. She showed me two examples of my work. One example, something I probably made, I made an A on. Another example, something I made a C on. And she was very stern. Uh, she said, Leonard, what is this blank? And what is this? And she looked me in the eye. I don't want to see this anymore. This is what I want to see. Why don't you believe in yourself? And I looked at lady in the eye and said, why are you talking to me like that? <laughs> what do you see that I don't see? That adult saw something in and helped me find my switch. And when I found that switch and turned it on, look out. Now that's probably happened for many of you, all right? So Keisha is familiar with this, she's seen me working with students, so here's a little quick philosophy that I try to bring with me and have been doing it now for over 33 years. If you want somebody to be excited about learning, you must get excited. Students model adult behavior. They want to grow up to be just like you. That's the scary part. Just like you. So what inspired me was somebody believed in me. Now, what's the most rewarding thing? Something that I try to pass on. And I can see it on some of your faces already. You have friends who sit around waiting for the teachers to tell them everything. You got a few friends like that in school, you know? That's like wanting cookies but not wanting to cook them. You understand what I'm talking about? Your little brother and sister know where mom and dad keep the food at home. And if they want something bad enough, they know how to get it. I'll say to you, if you want something bad enough, you know how. Why are we sitting around waiting for somebody else to tell us something? 
My philosophy is simple, and this is what motivates me and inspires me. If you want cookies, you learn to cook them. And if you want knowledge, you go get it. Stop waiting for somebody to give it to you. That's what I love. That's what motivates me, to help people to reach inside themselves. A teacher inspired me, and I love helping people to find that switch. Now, some of you have probably already been involved as mentors. Can, have you, some of you shared the joy of helping a child find their switch? Anybody, if you mentor a young child? When a child finds their switch and turns it on, you step back. All right, so that's what inspires uh, And probably to the day I die. All right, I've done with my son. In the interest of time, I'm going to
were like, kind of like the same problem as you. My mom was terrified every time she saw me with a screwdriver. So I always was very intrigued about how things work. I wanted to know how everything worked, and I put it apart, and not sometimes came exactly together. But that's how everything started. I was also really good at math, so that just put all together, and the fact that I loved ships took me to uh, marine engineering, and that's how my life started. I think the most rewarding part of being an engineer is the fact that uh, you get, or at least in my career, you, your customers come to you with a problem and you have to figure out how to solve and to make it work. And it is very rewarding to seek what they need done to develop the solution and to see it back in the field working right. So that's it's really good. All right, uh, does anyone know, help me help you uh, you had me at hello. What movie is that? Jerry Maguire. Sorry, man. I know, that's the funny part. So those that have seen that movie, um, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a sports agent. I played baseball in college. Um, my family, uh, a lot of baseball players. So I wanted to be a sports agent, and then I made a robot in high school and wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Um, so I was going to Texas A&M. And then I got a baseball scholarship, so I wanted to be a baseball player with Arkansas Pine Bluff. Then I got there, wanted to uh, make products, so got into industrial. Uh, then I went in my first job out of college into sanitation. And so with that being said, why I am where I am, it's not about really inspiring, it's about there's nothing that you can't do. You know, and there's always opportunities if you want to get in one career field, that's great. I think everyone in this panel has done more than one thing. Um, so my inspiration is doing new things, new challenges, and just being excited about the next step. Um, what's rewarding in my job is I love people, I love teaching, I love educating. Though I am hardcore in corporate America, um, I look at the 75 people that report to me uh, as my classroom. And so for me, I'm a teacher. I'm just a teacher in corporate America. So that's my, my joy every day. I am the original nerd. I'm a pro nerd. I have not known a time that I did not want to be in here. Um, played with Lincoln Logs, Legos, uh, Commodore 64. I sat around on the floor, went out in the dirt, pushed dirt around, crushed up. Uh, charcoal, make a paper go look black, dug holes in the ground. I have always, as far as I can tell, what I'm doing here. Um, so it, it's been, it's been an interesting path in the different stages. Uh, I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I think for me, it's, it's, it's the creative process. It's my, in high school, you know, I thought I wanted to be civil, and I, I, I decided that from a from a physics standpoint, I need to more. I wanted to be able to integrate uh, different aspects of technology together. And so I, I drifted more towards mechanicals. I had to go um, into my degree in mechanical. Um, and I, uh, you know, my interests are already first, so I, I can say I've never regretted it. It was always something else. I said, I've done that, I've done that. But just, there's just so much out there. I will tell you that you know, there's nothing, there was a moment um, just a short while ago when I, where I was sitting in the room. zoned out of the conversation for, for a minute. And what my mind focused on was that I was sitting on this table and I realized, I, what about an actual engineer? You're sitting on this table, we're solving a problem. Um, almost, almost like we were, we were in school, but this, this is actually real. We're actually trying to solve a real problem, discussing it, trying to figure out how we can, can be successful um, in, in making this product happen. It was just, it, an amazing moment in terms of realizing that this thing that you know, I, I think I always gravitate, I finally made it there. Um, you know, it, it is very, very rewarding to see um, possibilities become natural, natural creation. Um, something that comes to mind that's also very rewarding, uh, particularly you know, when you look at mentoring, you know, when you can say to yourself that, you know, 
there was great joy taking the road in terms of achieving your dream and be successful in your career as you look as I looked at yourselves as, as you know, I looked at uh, kids in the pre-college area and seeing that you know this dream can be can be theirs, seeing that I can help them obtain that dream, uh, be excited um, for them as they continue to see and push forward. That's amazingly rewarding. Amazingly rewarding. Why I can actually continue to mentor and give back. But um, even in that, I'm able to show a, a great deal of creativity and help them to um, be creative in solving those problems. So for each year, it's just it's all about solving problems and working through possibilities. And I, uh, I started off really around to. Well, if you can believe it, I started in pre-veterinary medicine, and like others, I said seven years of school, that's a whole lot of, a lot of time uh, to be a poor college student. So uh, luckily, I changed to marketing and transportation logistics, thinking I was going to be working for the city, designing all sorts of ways to be economical and get them from one place to the other. But once I discovered that the anger that I had was actually passion, the passion for people, the passion to help see folks, and that I really uh, like the science of human behavior, really understanding where people are coming from and how I can help people get where they need to go. Uh, and someone took a chance because I, I, uh, they, they kept asking, where, where can we find um, African American males to do this or, or Latina females to do that? And I'm sitting in that room, it's like, you find them in the same place you find everybody else, at the, at the Chamber of Commerce and at MBA conferences and ex and all these other places, you just have to look for them and make a concerted effort. So my passion, my interest in human resources and public relations was that reward that I could help somebody get a job, I could help talk to somebody and explain to them uh, you know, to, how to transfer those transferable skills to a career. This is what you want to do, this is what you want to be. It's all about getting a degree at the end of the day. Get your degree, then look for your job, look for your passion, look for what you want to to what you want to do. Um, I was in marketing and now I'm in, in HR and I had to learn. So that passion to look, to learn, um, to get there. Uh, and again, I, I think several folks here have said that it's transferable skills. The additional passion for me is children. Uh, that's why I'm on the Columbus Board of Education and hope to become a teacher someday. Um, and just seeing them learn, so I think someone said when you see that trigger go when we when many of you may or may not know, those of you who are studying, you know, all of you are studying STEM, you can you can practice that almost in any field. If you have seen some of the new Columbus City School buildings, we have uh, many of them that have uh, solar panels, uh, uh, rock water recycling will be built on a roof where the water comes in, it recycles through, it comes through our toilets, so we can save money at the end of the day and save taxpayer money. Uh, we, we created schools that have natural lighting so we can use less light for our children to study. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity for you to utilize your degree. So don't just, uh, I, I think these are, you've seen a lot of areas where you can utilize your skills. What I want you to know is that you can use those skills in many different aspects uh, of a career. Like I said, my parents are from Puerto Rico, and my dad was in charge of picking everybody up at the airport. So when I, when I was young, I would always go to the Cleveland International Airport. And back then, you were allowed to go out onto the observation deck and watch the planes come in. Now, with TSA, you're not even allowed to enter the airport almost. Um, so, so at age 16, I started flying. I, I, it, so I enjoyed the flight. Um, the being in the air. Um, currently, I'm, I'm close to three quarters of a year of being actually in the air. Um, I'm over 6,000 hours of flight time. And it's just something that I really enjoy and I continue, I continue enjoying. The most rewarding part of it is, is licensing other pilots, teaching them how to fly. And recently, there was a young lady that was joining the Navy, and I had to get her check right done the day before she left to the Navy when she passed the test. And I, my, my exams are not easy, they're standardized, but I don't give them away, I'm not a Santa Claus. Um, she passed the test, we came out and I said congratulations, and I got the biggest hug from this, this young lady. And what was rewarding to me was that she was joining the Navy to be a, um, a, a 
fighter pilot. And maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that, that was unheard of. But now they're, they're female fighter pilots and everything. So I feel that I, I was part of that, and where she, she can go after her, her dreams. Thank you. So what are your questions? and think about 
about that, then everything just really doesn't get to you as much. And I think that you get to enjoy the experience and not so much of this is my to do list. I need to do A and then B and then C. Because life is really about the journey. And so, chill out. I think the other thing you need to remember is that um, it's okay to say I don't know. I think as, as minority students, as minorities, as women, we always feel that we have to have that answer. And I, I studied four years, I have this degree, I should know this, but I can't remember what accounting 201 was. Uh, it's, it's okay, it's okay, especially I think a lot of, uh, of us talked about how we had to continuously reinvent, it, reinvent ourselves. I didn't know a thing about IT other than where the on button was and I knew it had a keyboard and it had a mouse and that's about it. I had to learn what um, uh, the memory card, where it went and how many RAMs it needed, this and this and that. And that, you know, I was, I was a learner, I was willing to learn. And I, I, I've been asking a lot of questions because sometimes we're afraid to ask questions because we might look dumb, right? I'm not gonna ask the professor a question, I'm not gonna ask for help. That's the other thing, I'm not gonna ask for help because I'm gonna be seen as we just, but I'll tell you, you do have to be careful. You know, don't don't also look like you don't know anything. So don't ask a thousand questions. You know, limit it down to about two or three. It's okay, then try to research the rest. But I think those are the biggest things. And as a person that works in human resources, and I and and I unfortunately have the thrill or the uh, of hiring people. Sometimes I have the thrill of hiring people, and then I have the, dis the misfortune of also being the person that walks you out. Uh, so I get to be the person that fires you. Uh, unfortunately, but what what happens when we get to that point is because people didn't ask for help, uh, people didn't act, say I don't know and I need to be retrained, I need to learn again, and this is what I people freak out. I did X Y Z. I said, did somebody die? Did somebody die? No. Did someone catch on fire? No. Did you do something unethical? Did you know? Do you have like a thousand dollars in your pocket and you're walking out the door and you're not supposed to be doing that? No, then it'll be okay. It will be okay. We'll figure it out. It'll get solved. Work with your manager. Uh, you know, so it's it's just being able to. Uh, I think some people call that vulnerability, being a little bit vulnerable, uh, and, and and allowing yourself to learn because you're gonna learn every day. I think there's people up here in the panel that you know some of our more mature uh, panelists will tell you they're learning something every day, and it's okay and it's exciting. And it keeps you from being bored. All right, I'll answer the short bit of that. Uh, how many of you speak more than one language? I wish I had paid attention to my foreign language classes. That's that's what I do better. So, and uh, uh, the fact that you do, and you know, and some of you, and here's some of the uniqueness about this. Uh, we had a choice. Some of you had another language, but you had another language. You had to survive. And I'm proud of some of you because some of you probably uh, uh, survivors or refugees or you come to this country and you, you, you made the difference. And you, you're picking up the pieces and your, your life's going on and you got a legacy of your family to hold up. I wish I had paid attention. I learned French, I learned Spanish, but I didn't master it. And uh, recently, well, I've been for a decade now, I married a Hungarian, one of the most difficult languages in the world. Uh, and Budapest is beautiful country. And I wish I could talk to them more when I go over there. But I talk to my mother-in-law just a little bit. So I know just enough. So learning a foreign language, take advantage. If you will learn because you want to, that's what you do. Don't learn because you have to. Do it because you want to. Do. So, you know, with every position, there's always 
a new ground and new expectations. So it's like you're starting all over again. And it, you know, having those relationships, folks to say, oh no, I've already did that, or I've already had that failure. You don't have to go down the same road. But sometimes it's very easy to feel isolated. You feel like oh, I'm the youngest, I'm this, I'm that, and you don't reach out to people that may not look like you, may be older, may have different, you know, experiences backgrounds, but, you know, having those folks in in your circle, in your network, they can help you soften the blow when you have those failures, and they can help avoid and alleviate some of the ones that could easily just say, oh, no, don't go down that road. You've already tried it. Did you make sure you check this? Did you do this? So just having those relationships with people before you need, before you fail, you know, having that genuine relationship with people feel comfortable. I want to add something that is a little, is related, but I think it's important. One of the things that I wish that I had known earlier was to discover that I had a learning disability. Um, I didn't find out that I had ADD until I was in grad school, and that my advisors helped me. And once I figured that out, it made a huge difference. How I performed in school after work, how I realized that I've been working so hard those years, I always thought, like, why do I have to work so much harder than my peers to get similar grades and sometimes not as good, even though that I'm the one te and teaching them, tutoring them, and they perform better than me. And it wasn't until when my graduate advisor realized that there's something with you, you probably should look into it. So if any of you have, think you have a learning disability, or if you know you have it, don't be proud. There's a lot of resources, a lot of help. You're not taking advantage of anything. You are just getting, just getting what you need. So seek the help. It really makes a difference. And also start documenting it right now because you're going to need it when you go to the workplace. Sometimes you might need accommodations depends on what you have. Um, some workplaces, you know, right now you go and you hear a lot of these workplaces are great in Google open and everyone works like it's a body. If I were there, I would be miserable because it's just too much discussion. And something you need to have that needs documented so whenever you're in the workplace, you can have them work with them in your future employers and community. Other questions? Yeah, I uh, And so it may seem easier uh, because it's not as structured, 
but you have to find ways to differentiate yourself because not performing well in grad school isn't a C, not performing grad school is being asked to leave, okay? So it's, it's a little more nuanced and uh, not as explicit as undergrad. I would definitely say that, you know, the first two years, in terms of how I enjoyed versus the last two years, certainly the last two years I enjoyed it. I think the big thing you want to make sure is that you choose the right major. Um, if you choose something that you don't enjoy, I think it can be just as painful as the first two years. Um, I, I love, like I said, I love math, so I love my math classes. Um, wasn't that big. Sorry, no offense, Charles, you did not enjoy my physics classes nearly as much, or my chemistry classes, or, you know, but once I got to my major, because I loved, and loved the process, and loved the ability to do real world problems, um, I enjoyed it. So I, I just think, it, but I think it's important, though, to get into something you enjoy. Because I did, you know, on, conversely, I didn't enjoy grad school as much, because I chose something that I didn't really enjoy, which I thought I would, but at the time, I didn't enjoy it as much, so I didn't enjoy grad school. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop the questions right now because, one, I need to give you all some homework to do for the summer. Um, most of you are finished finals. The first thing I'd like you to do is get business cards tonight from our panel members um, and follow up with them, at least maybe two of them, follow up with uh, some of the panel members if you have additional questions for specific panel members, make sure you get their business card or contact information and, and continue the, the discussion. Also, over the summer, try to participate in at least one STEM-related activity. Uh, attend a workshop or go to a science museum or interview a STEM professional. Um, to keep thinking about you know, where you're headed uh, with your STEM degree. Also, make sure you visit the uh, Undergraduate Research Office website. Get to be very familiar with it, particularly look at the parts about how to choose a mentor, how to choose a project, how to look for funding, and um, make a commitment to uh, making an appointment with Jackie Lippart over at the Undergraduate Research Office and talk with her one-on-one -on, -one on possibilities for undergraduate research for you uh, for next year. Um, if you're not currently involved in undergraduate research, that is, uh, make sure that, that you uh, meet with her. And another project I'd like you to think about is try to, um, if, if you know any middle school age kids, try to um, talk with them and interest them in STEM. Um, because we certainly need to have a, a pathway for more STEM majors. So, so those are your homework for t uh, 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 items for tonight. Um, so now at this point, I, I'd like us to thank our panel members, and then I'll give you an opportunity to come on up, uh, talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, and make sure you get those business cards so that you can uh, continue the discussion. So thank you very much.